Good to all. Um, I am Biju George, and on behalf of our institute, I would like to welcome you all to today's event. Today we have with us Dave Turner, Global Operations of BP, and uh, Dave will be discussing with us on the subsea inspections and the path to 2020. A few words about Dave Turner. Dave is the Vice President, Subsea Production Operations of BP with global functional responsibility for the performance of the subsea infrastructure, delivering safe operations, production availability, risk mitigation, and for building the subsea operations organizational capability. Earlier, Dave was the GOM subsea operations manager based in Houston from 2007 to 2011, and prior to that was based in the North Sea, where he developed and managed the subsea organization. In 2004, Dev became the overall manager of BP's North Sea subsea business, supporting the cross asset portfolio of projects and operating performance units. This included responsibility for the UK's first operational deep water subsea production activity west of Shetland in the Finnovan and Shagalian fields. In his early career, he helped post in op operations and development planning which led to emerging subsea projects and operations business, including structural and pipeline repair programs. He was the project engineer for BP's first subsea production flexible tieback. His emergence into subsea engineering came from a project engineering role, implementing underwater repairs to the 40s field structures, requiring hyperbar hyperbaric coffer dam and routed brace repairs. In 2005, Dave was awarded the Society of Underwater Technology David Patrick Award for Technology Achievement. And in 2007, the UK industry body, Subsea UK, awarded Dave the Individual Achievement Award. He is a fellow of our institute. And let's welcome Dave Turner to deliver the presentation. Thank you, Vijay. Thanks for that uh, warm welcome. And uh, I'm sure you can hear Thanks for the invitation to be here to, to talk, and uh, I guess welcome again to everybody here. And I know there are a number of people, uh, mostly West, I think, because of the time, uh, listening into this on the webcast. So uh, I guess good morning to those that are. So, uh, so the, the title of my talk or lecture is uh, Subsea Inspection Path to 2020, Disrupting Ourselves. Uh, what does it look like going forwards? What do we need to do to get there? And I think that's a question that a lot of people are asking at the moment and looking at particularly given the environment that, uh, that we're in. This opening slide um, is actually intended to show you what we typically see on the left there. You've got a, a floater um, and um, what lies beneath it though is something akin to a refinery and that comes down to the success of what we've, we've delivered and, and built over the last uh, 20 years, getting to the technology challenges. Mm -hmm. So that's what lies beneath. And I think that is what we're talking about today. It's about the what, how can we actually start to turn this into an opportunity where we can engage with the environment that we're now in. So here's the content, a little bit about the business environment, subsea production, current status today, um, the opportunity that comes out of this the enablers that I see, potential pathways, and some disruption examples of where that sort of thing is already happening just now. And then summary, and we'll have some questions and answers afterwards. So, um, just first of all, I don't need to say too much about the oil and gas business environment, I guess, because everybody's fully aware. I mean, it's not too long ago we had the oil price at over $100 a barrel, and, and, uh, and then it went down into the 20s. And it's, I don't know what exactly it is at this moment, but it was somewhere around the high 40s over the early parts of this week, and I think finished there today. So it's actually had a catastrophic uh, effect on the on the whole of the oil and gas industry, as you'd imagine. Effectively, it's the bottom line flow that's been more than halved. So oil and gas companies are, uh, are rebasing themselves in that environment. Um, a lot of them for survival, to be quite honest. And all companies are looking at options to increase efficiencies and profitability and um, developing new strategies. Now, this lecture is actually intended to say how does a subsea inspection part of the business relate to that? Uh, the subsea business is a key cost driver. It needs to relate to it. How does it relate to it? And, uh, and that environment, that very challenging environment that we have at the moment. 
And although I speak from an oil and gas operator's perspective, uh, from a, an experience that I've had for all of my uh, working life in the oil and gas industry, this should actually also be relevant to key players who also gather inspection, do the inspection, that gather the data. And uh, the successful ones who uh, can adapt to this change of environment uh, will actually uh, thrive and survive. But the one thing I would say is that uh, uh, the, best, uh, the best analysis says that uh, in 20 years' time, oil and gas is still going to be providing a third of the global demand. So this isn't doom and gloom. It's just purely that the adaption to a new environment requires us to make changes and to challenge ourselves, providing we get the right approach. So that's a little bit about the business environment that we're in. A little bit about subsea production. Uh, it's now material. And uh, this is largely the result of the success on meeting many of the challenges over the last 20 or 30 years. And um, at every step of development to go into deeper water, we've actually had uh, problems and challenges and cost increases, as everybody knows. But today, uh, we, and I'll speak from a BP perspective, a third of BP's production is now coming from subsea wells. And um, as a result of the work that's been going on to drive reliability, as of next month, we'll be up at 98% uh, of production reliability for the last two years. You know, hovering around 98 plus percent. And that's just typical of what's going on across the industry. So it's largely as a result of the success of meeting those challenges and getting us to the point where subsea production now is not just something which is um, uh, interesting, it's now bottom line critical to the business that uh, has invested to achieve that. So the question then goes, if it's bottom line uh, critical, um, what about the cost and efficiency that can be developed here? Uh, what are the pathways forwards for continuously Im improving? Because I think we all know that, particularly from an engineering perspective, we never stand still. There's always more that can be done. And so people should think differently about the future. And I'm, what I'm trying to do here is give some insights in terms of how that can happen. So current status today, um, every company that uh, has invested to get to the point where they've got subsidy production, they have departments or parts of the organisation that take responsibility for the subsidy infrastructure and ensure that the system integrity is fit for service, uh, the risks on it are reduced, and you maximise, we maximise the production through it. So I'm pleased to see that as we work this forwards in BP, we've got to that high level of plant reliability on a big investment that's now producing a large material amount of uh, production. And I think that's typical of what each company is, has been doing. It wouldn't be acceptable for investments to be made without any other sort of uh, basis. In terms of the integrity management process, that was the what. In terms of the how, um, well, we drive integrity management programs, which typically look at the, the failures. We go through failure modes and effects criticality analyses to find out what the failure modes are. Um, and we have uh, programs which actually allow us to do that in a, in a systematic way. We've developed those. Um, we seek to understand those failure modes to a greater level of detail than we used to do before, actually understand why it will fail and what it will fail from. Um, we seek to manage the threats with barriers, and this is a typical bow tie uh, diagram here where on the left hand side, in the centre there you have an event, uh, say loss of primary uh, containment, a leak in other words. On the left hand side you have themes running forwards with barriers on each theme, and we concentrate on what what barriers do we need to actually maintain in, in a good condition to prevent that uh, event from occurring? On the right hand side of the bow tie, uh, the barriers there are to prevent escalation if the event has occurred. And that's typical of what we do in the, in the industry now. So managing the threat with barriers on both sides of, of the event. We actually then, we actually then uh, use risk-based inspection to try and focus down the volume of inspection that we need to do. Um, and we seek to continuously improve it. But I would say that that is still, we're still in a bit of a hybrid world where we're not yet, um, I think we've emerged from a place where we didn't have the confidence because of all of these early uh, defects, these defects that we had as we emerged and developed the subsea business and subsea systems, we've actually applied a pretty blanket inspection approach. Um, that's my experience and I think that's probably typical of across the industry as well. So we drive inspection through this program uh, and we have monitoring activities as well, that's uh, intended to show some corrosion and erosion monitoring. But the inspection activities that we do in the subsea world, um, they all involve um, 
high cost activity. You know, there's a vessel at the end of the chain, there's an RV, there's a diver, there's an AUV. Um, so the, the activities are all high cost and we end up driving contracting strategies to improve the margins, to try and get to the point where we can be more effective and efficient. And typically our contracting strategies have been about driving margins and deflating as the oil prices has dropped. Um, we gather a lot of information through this process and uh, we produce safe, reliable, fit for purpose systems and that has to be the boundary condition. There's no doubt that nothing changes. But the question is, uh, it delivers, our process delivers, but where's the efficiency opportunity? You can't just say that's the end goal and therefore we stand still. And in the environment that we're in now, that, that is the challenge. So where is the opportunity? First of all, uh, I painted the picture where a lot of activity subsea much of which is done from the era where we had a less confident understanding of what was going to fail next, what was going to break next. And uh, we've, you know, I think most, most uh, companies who have invested in the subsea business know that we've been continuously responding to actually many failures. And uh, certainly five years ago in BP, we had a low level of efficiency uh, to get to the point of where we are now. Um, and I would say that the, the opportunity really lies around uh, a more precise understanding of the infrastructure failure modes. Uh, we've gone some way towards it, but we're still in a hybrid uh, world at the moment. And then if you take that further forwards, what data do you actually require more precisely to know that drives that failure mode? So I think that is really the, the light for me that comes on. But then the next piece to this is identifying the most efficient means of gathering that data that you need. Are we doing that? Are we applying the most effective technique to get that data, having understood what data we do need? And in addition, and this is where I think we've been confused in the industry, uh, technology application needs to be in support of that, in service of that goal. And I think in the past, we've applied blanket funding to technology programs that we feel may have an application at some point. But in some cases, we've developed some very clever tools and then found that actually, from a strategic perspective, we didn't need to apply them. Their role is more in a niche, uh, is a niche situation where you have specific technology gaps uh, or, or uh, integrity gaps, but the probability of that is probably very low. Did it justify the business investment in the first place? Probably not. So technology in service of that goal, but the root cause is what data do you really need? And then the last point here is, uh, in terms of the opportunity, is introducing a, a more collaborative business win-win environment. Uh, this will not work just by driving the supply chain in a, in a typical conventional way. It has to be done to the point where the stakeholders in this can actually uh, win as well. And I speak about companies that have invested in vessels and ROVs and AUVs and diving uh, capability. It's hard for them when their business model is about utilization, maximizing the utilization. We have to find a way to actually get to the place where we can incentivize to the point where they get a win out of this overall cost reduction that allows the subsea business to remain viable. So what are the key enablers? Um, I put at the top here, uh, and I, I'm very, very clear in my own mind that this is number one, it's engineering and competence, engineering competence and, uh, and judgment. And I think it's very appropriate to be able to say that here as well. Um, this is what really is absolutely needed to allow you to say this is the failure mode that's going to occur in that piece of plant. This is the piece of data that you need to assure against that. Beyond that, uh, core integrity processes that link firmly back to design expectations. If we know what the design is, you know, design is designed for and expected, we can start to look for the, uh, the things that actually potentially weak signals that allow us to understand if we're st starting to step outside design expectations. And the next thing is, as we particularly important as we go into a global world, is, is systematic application. When you start to integrate regions together, I mean in BP we have uh, six producing subsea regions, very important to get leverage and efficiency to be able to start to develop it systematically across the company. And I think that's the same for any, any organisation. Um, predictive data tools, we can make more out of the data that we gather. We can start to look to see with early warnings, weak signals, we can start to predict. This has a big impact in terms of, I'll come back to this a little bit later on, but this has a big impact in terms of the money that we spend down the uh, supply chain 
and in the supporting activities. And the last key enabler I would mention is again the creation of the business environment where collaboration will occur and we incentivize the key stakeholders to want to play this game to get the overall cost model down. So where do we want to get to? Well, I put number one up first of all as being nothing changes, safe, reliable, fit for purpose, subsea systems. That is the boundary condition and whatever we do, it has to support that. Um, but we do want to get to a place where we can focus more on data, more on data and not the activity, which is where we've come from, for the reasons I've explained. We only need to get the data that we actually need to allow us to make the judgments around fitness for service. We can start to use low, low risk, low cost activities and methods to obtain it. And at the end of the day, if we drive out risk and cost and deliver a new way of developing this, uh, delivering this objective, we'll be successful as an organisation, as a business, as an industry. And on the right there, uh, this is just intended to show some pieces of equipment that could actually start to gather data underwater, uh, transmit them to the surface, and then remotely uh, using telemetry and, and web based systems so the infrastructure gets them back to the places where the decisions are made. That's where we're heading to, that's where we want to get to. And that probably is going to be the lowest cost uh, um, solution to achieve this goal at the end of the day. In terms of potential pathways, uh, I've, I've listed five key access points. And first one, again, is back to this focus on data. Um, being required to monitor for a failure and not blanket activity. And uh, this requires precise data definition linked to root cause failure understanding and acquisition requirements to drive the subsea inspection activity. Not the other way around, blanket activity. Let's find out what's important out of it. Um, is this being challenged in, in the organisations in the subsea business? Um, bearing in mind this underlying principle. Uh, are we getting really clear what data is actually needed to drive it? Uh, are we investing in the data tools? Because if we're not, it's, it's a jungle, it's a forest. It's a swathes of data are regularly captured and often we only use small parts of it. So we need the tools to allow that filtering. Now this uses a, a couple of examples here. You know, one of my colleagues uh, remarked that, you know, uh, for um, a failure of a, a dynamic riser, uh, at the touchdown point, uh, we're concerned about the minimum bend radius. And of course, typically we've applied general visual inspection um, in high water depths, 6,000, 7,000 feet perhaps, and uh, we've got rises, the dynamic rises in much low water depths, but all of that drives high cost activity. Um, the minimum bend radius is actually the thing that we're most concerned about, or one of the things that we're most concerned about. The floater at the top of that, its GPS coordinate, may actually provide a large part of the assurance that you need. Not all, you've still got things like dropped objects, but hopefully the other process uh, will actually be managing and mitigating that. But could you actually start to argue that the watch keeping circle of your floater is actually providing a large piece of assurance against the minimum bend radius of that riser on the seabed? Um, I just recently, uh, we were looking for a hydrocarbon uh, leakage on a, on a line and underwater detection was the primary concern and it was suggested this is a good example of how we can actually drift back to activity it was suggested a low cost technique technique would be to apply uh, an AUV this is an automated underwater vehicle uh, put it in and launch it which gathers lots of data and it would have been lower cost but the reality is it gathers swathes of data the only piece of data that we actually were looking for was a hydrocarbon detection underwater so why would you do that I mean, the answer probably would be to actually put transponders on the seabed that look for hydrocarbon uh, and then have that transmitted back um, and so on um, so that's the first point it's about focusing on the data that you actually need um, as the first pathway second one is back to this win-win environment and collaboration with key suppliers and do you have the right key suppliers in place are they aligned to this longer term understanding or are they just interested, for example, if they've invested in a lot of inspection capability, vessels and RVs, following the all business model, which is about driving the utilisation. And uh, if you've got a supplier who is aligned to how this is changing, what you then have to do is get real clarity around who has the accountability for the data, who has the accountability for recommending what is the most efficient way of gathering that data. And I think you need to get that supplier 
You need to get that partner to this, and you need to get clarity about what your respective roles are in that process. And then the other thing is, are we actually engaging them on a, now that we have you know, global programs, on the global demand basis where there's potentially a much greater piece of prize there and leverage that they could take part in to make it far more attractive than it was there before. And I think the last piece here is about thinking creativity, creatively whilst, uh, whilst trying to develop this win-win environment. So a third pathway is about the technology application, and I've mentioned already that um, um, let the data drive the technology need, and uh, only develop it if you find you've got a you've got a, found, found that you've got a gap. Um, the technology, I would assert, will actually accelerate if you can focus on the data you need and then the gap that you've got to close, rather than trying to push a lot of technology across a, a broad wave line, a wavelength. So I think this could be a key to accelerating the technology we need, and uh, may it would actually limit the amount of development that we need to do, but on the specific areas. I talk about uh, as potential pathway here. Uh, you know, I'll come on to it a little bit further. But crawlers and robotics, and uh, we've got regions where um, we've been using, and this is actually a good transfer of technology, say from the the you know, marine world as well. Where I think this has been going on perhaps for longer, but using robotics for cleaning chains or looking at chains. And uh, we're starting to do this on some of our uh, floaters in the difficult to access interface areas, you know, the splash zones, uh, and even on the FPSOs around the hulls as well, where FPSOs don't go in for uh, uh, ship uh, certification, but they have to do it on station um, whilst, they're, uh, whilst they're out there. So, Applying technology to do things like that, and then actually look at low-cost ROVs that can be launched from platforms, or AUVs, which may not need vessels at all. All of this is actually looking to a low-cost application of the technology that exists today, but then actually, with the data that you're asking for, with the gap that you've identified, based upon the engineering judgment that's there, there may be a very strong business case to say, we actually need to close that piece of integrity gap there and we'll focus very hard to close it with a piece of technology development. So there is technology here that's needed but it needs to be done in a focused way. Next point is around uh, failure degradation and prediction and I've talked about this already but we are we investing sufficiently in predictive capability? Are we starting to look further forward from the value that we can get out of the data that we get today? There's a lot of value that comes out of that. Are we actually identifying where it will occur, how frequent it will occur? I suspect not. And we're merely getting um, um, confused when we take a blanket data approach, unless we've actually got the tools that can dig out what you actually need and then apply a trending basis. So the next one is uh, pretty unique to the subsea business, but we call this the PRS, the Preparedness and Response Scheme. And being prepared globally for uh, this is very important. Uh, it's in service of production. And minimum, mean time to repair, if we can minimize that, we get maximum production, we get maximum reliability coming back from the system. But what this means, and I would say today, is that we have inventories of sparing. We have far too much. We know that. Uh, we have tools that are needed to actually intervene. Um, and we have, we have duplicates, triplicates. We may not have them in the right place because we don't know where the failures are going to occur. And then the vendor maintenance costs that we have across all of those spares in warehouses around the world, and on the toolings that have been left to actually keep in good condition for when we need them, they're all excessive. Now this can all be optimised globally versus the expected failures. If you know what failures are going to occur, you can have to optimise uh, storage, positioning and cost to make sure that it's in the right place. But you can actually start to use key ingredients who will actually play a bigger role and start to drive performance management around availability of sparing and tooling and response time. And all this is in support of uh, production. production reliability at the end of the day, which is the investment that is the capital that was put in the first place. And it's all the mechanism of the and failure prediction is all dependent on having the right data. And we have the right engineering behind to say which is the right data. So in terms of potential pathways, there are multiple routes. 
Uh, but I would say the single denominator is to be data guided and engineering competence. And uh, in BP, we've uh, been working on all of these access areas for some time. And on a global basis, it's starting to come together now. And we're actually looking forward to a 2020, 2020 strategy across the bigger company. And uh, I'm really pleased to see that we're actually linking subsea inspection reductions into that, to, you know, into the global business goals as well. Because that's what's going to drive us forward. So if we can start to see pathways there, we can start to drive the specific activities. But there is no silver, there is no single silver bullet to this. I'll say. So just in terms of some disruption examples, um, I put one or two here, and the first one on the left is uh, it's out of subsea, obviously. It's the San Francisco uh, Gate Bridge, and um, I understand that they used to use. Um, uh, people to actually do high levels volume of uh, inspection activity on those suspension wires and now routinely there are crawlers that are actually doing that so it's not much of a stretch from the marine world I guess to be able to do that but it, it's now saving hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and of course the risk is much reduced when you're not involving um, uh, people in that sort of activity. The, the middle picture is um, one where we actually routinely employ abseilers. And I remember when abseilers were seen as a fantastic sort of uh, revelation compared to putting scra scaffolding up that got washed out with, with uh, especially near the splash zone with uh, winter gales and storms, and then had to be rebuilt again. And then the scaffolding had to be picked up off the seabed. It hadn't done any damage on the way down. So abseilers were seen as a good sort of uh, approach. But now actually we're starting to um, talk about using crawlers to actually displace abseilers. And we're doing this on, um, in, in splash zones on, on different uh, structures, uh, in BP and across the industry. And also starting to do it on uh, RFPSOs, which don't go into dry dock. So we do what's called a UWAL, the Underwater Inspection and Lure for Dry Dock. And uh, the opportunity there is literally millions and millions to be able to do that with robotics and uh, crawlers. And um, not to mention the risk reduction. The third one on the right hand side is again about the robotics that can be used on the mowing chains and the FPSO. So we've got a real opportunity there. That's just step one. These are the lower cost activities. Step two is you ask yourself, do you actually need all that data anyway? You know, have we actually put a, an engineering microscope on it and said, is that data absolutely necessary to be gathered? So once you start to you know, reduce the cost of gathering it, You've got the partner who can perhaps suggest a different technique for doing it, who's aligned to the longer term goal of staying in business and continuing to do this in this lower, lower cost environment. And the second step is then actually, do we need the data anyway? So it's a double whammy. Um, this is actually an example of a, um, a lower cost focus a pilot study uh, where we've uh, looked at uh, AUVs as being a potentially cheaper option to having an ROV deployed from a vessel. And uh, the analysis that was done here, this is, this is you know, just, just within this last year, um, showing significant number of days on that particular region, 39 out of 140 could be moved to AUVs, which is just under 30% of the inspection uh, volume. Now, that only concentrated looking with a horizontal AUV approach. Uh, there is AUV technology that allows you to look at a vertical. And the other thing that hasn't been done yet is to say, well, what will that give us on a global basis of demand? You know, if we set up a global strategy for AUVs and there may be a horizontal and a vertical component to that. Um, and in many cases, it may be possible to actually uh, avoid the use of vessels or, or trigger uh, the, the uh, non-required need for a vessel, in fact. And then what we haven't done is apply the data focus to say, well, that's a cheaper way of getting it and we can start to leverage it globally but do we need all that data anyway? Is the second question. So you can really see how this could collapse in if we start to get the right sort of origin, the engineering competence and the focus on the data. And a digital focus that we've started to apply, um, we've been working this sort of process for a number of years and um, on, on valves, for example, which are typically a, a big concern, what you see there in the center on the left-hand side is uh, key health indicators. And by looking at the, 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 um, the data that relates to those KHIs, uh, you can actually start to see advance change, early warning of things that are deteriorating, increased fluid consumption, or reduced closure time, etc., etc. 
what this will lead to is being able to predict a failure time for which you can actually put a planned program of repair in place. <coughs> which when you go planned as opposed to unplanned in the subsea business, that is massively, uh, that is much, much cheaper. You can have the tools and the spurs in the right place and you can predict it. On the right hand side, um, this is a piece of work that's going on at the moment. It's work in progress. We're starting to work with a number of suppliers who are saying, well, a sort of um, industrial app store, uh, we'll actually, you tell us the routines that you think you need to, you know, answer the questions to the failure modes that you envisage. Give us the data, we'll turn the handle with the algorithm and give you the answer back. So this actually has the potential to be, it's early days, but it has the potential to be uh, fast, dynamic, leaves uh, the people owning the data who actually have accountability for the data and the judgment at the end of the day, and, and actually much, much reduced cost. It could be cloud-based, uh, and we could get very high levels of response from this type of approach with a very discreet focus around the question that you're trying to answer. And then this last one really is, I like this one, it's thinking creatively. And um, we just recently had a, a, a subsea integrity concern. And um, we had in this bay that you can see here, uh, a sheen which actually was causing significant concern because it wasn't clear which pipeline was actually leaking or potentially leaking. Um, but we couldn't be sure. And we have a cycle of tanker loadings. And without having that clarity, the next uh, tanker cycle loading wouldn't be able to occur. So there's a big production risk behind this and uh, needed rapid resolution. So we had a package of measures that were in play we had, uh, as you can see, the water depth in a bay like this. It's a remote region, clear. And uh, you can see actually on the right there, you can see at least two pipelines. Um, getting divers launched in that environment, safely with all the protocol, was taking time. We had pressure, um, um, pressure tests being set up. Um, but in the middle of all of this, and uh, try, we had an ROV in the water, mounted from a non-typical ROV boat. It's quite different to a deep water uh, system as you can see, um, a really creative piece of thinking produced a drone. And uh, I'll just show you this little video clip if it'll play. You'll see there, um, in that very clear water, you see the ROV, which is the yellow thing in the center of the screen. And if you look very carefully, you actually start to see some condensate globules that were coming to the surface. And if you wait a little bit longer, you will actually see one on the right hand side. The ROV was, this was completely invisible in the water. On the right hand side, can you see that condensate globule coming up? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Once on the surface, it suddenly spreads to a very thin level and you get the diffraction and you get the sheening. It looks far worse than it really is. And there it is. The, so that was the piece of evidence that by itself wouldn't have been sufficient, but it absolutely clinched with the other evidence from pressure testing and from the ROV work and from our knowledge of the pipeline system to say that the actual the integrity was okay and this was actually a disused line that was actually causing the problem. So a really neat creative piece of thinking. And here we had, we were just about to mount highly expensive ROV operations, diving operations, and this provided a piece of evidence that allowed us to make a conclusion with adding a piece of jigsaw puzzle that was absolutely critical. So in summary, uh, I said I would talk about you know, path to 2020, disrupting ourselves, what does it look like going forwards, and what do we need to do to get there? And what I've tried to do is, is, is paint that picture. And I would say that, look, we've started a journey. Um, there will be disruption, you can see that. And there's a lot yet more to play for in the subsea space. Uh, and I think an early conclusion is that we need to change the paradigm from activity focus uh, and utilization to data focus underpinned by engineering judgment and the tools uh, that, that go with that. And I would conclude by saying, look, in the subsea space, there's a really significant prize in cost efficiency and risk, risk reduction yet to play for. So although we're in this very harsh environment, and it will be a competitive environment, and it's not likely to return to where it was before, there's a lot to play for here. And hopefully this has actually given some insight into the pathways and things that we can start to consider to get there. So that's it. I'll just say, look, really, if you've got any questions, I'd be happy to try and, try and answer them. 
Sorry, Adrian Howard Jones. I wonder if you can say something about the actual um, defects with the, that you have been detecting through the inspection program. And you mentioned, for example, the, the, the problems of uh, inspecting for control on NBR, um, minimum bend radius. Um, this is an area where engineers can be very sensitive, mm. but the relationship between violating the minimum bend radius and actual failures mm. isn't so clear to me. Do you have instances of uh, failures arising from violation of minimum bend radius, for example? No, uh, we, we don't. And um, we've been fortunate enough to be able to manage, for example, floaters within the watch keeping circle. But that becomes one of the parameters that we, we are concerned about. And um, looking for the position of that uh, riser and the, where it touches on the seabed, looking for evidence of movement. That's where the GVI, the global, you know, the gross visual inspection has actually provided the, provided the additional confidence. But um, I would say that, from my experience, we haven't had that occurring once installed correctly. And once we start looking at uh, those sort of parameters, we haven't seen failures. And um, that's not to say it couldn't occur, but this was about what data do we need to give us insurance to say that it won't occur. And at the moment, I believe we're still sort of doing lots of things to blanket inspect when we could now, with some confidence, start to focus down and say, and, it, and your point is, is a good one because if you fail um, a flexible riser underneath a floater with people on it, that's high consequence. So we need to be very, very careful to look at not just the fatigue and the minimum bed radius, but look at all of the, all of the failure modes. <coughs> I just use that as one example to, uh, to bring out the fact that a different piece of data might give us the assurance we need. Are you thinking in terms of steel catenary risers or are you thinking in terms of flexible pipe risers? Where, where is... Well, I, th I think both. Mm. I think both. I mean, that is one of the failure modes, o you know, overbending. Um, it's not the only failure mode. I mean, we have annual eye on flexible risers that we need to keep an eye on to make sure they're not flooding. There's evidence of sheet failure. And uh, um, and again, do we have any experience of those sort of things? We've had early experience when they're installed and the damage. We put preventative measures in. But have we had in-life failures? Uh, we've monitored for a number of years and then we start to draw some confidence from that start to say we can perhaps retract back from some of these um, inspection measures that we're taking. Can you say something about the categories of failure that you have actually experienced? I mean, it, 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 these are the most pressing reasons for, for inspection, aren't they? To my knowledge, we haven't had failures. Well, you, you, you've detected leaks from pipelines, for example, or... Well, on pipelines, we've, uh, we've always got that ever-present loss of primary containment risk. Right. And so, hmm. on the left-hand side of the bow tie, the barriers that would be, would be applying would be around um, corrosion and erosion detection, making sure that we're injecting the right inhibitors, are we doing those sort of things. And then... You're doing that through, through pigging cycles, or...? And then, of course, pigging cycles that sweep the line, sweep the water out, and... Um, and so we have a, uh, an integrity regime that would require a combination of those internal processes, injections, and then external. The erosion, corrosion, and the internal processes that are driven from a top side's perspective, they don't involve vessels, and they're always a lot less expensive anyway. Mm -hmm. So but the integrity regime is really a combination of that, the corrosion, the erosion, the monitoring, and the external inspection. What I've been pointing to here is, uh, I'm not advocating in any way reducing the, the, uh, the corrosion and the erosion and the internal activities and the pigging activities. What I am doing is saying that the external activities are all high cost. And in fact, if you have to run an intelligent pig, typically you're talking about 500,000 to a million dollars each time. Is it possible that you can find a different technique that allows you to uh, not have to run that at the same frequency? So whenever you look at your subsea infrastructure, it always involves high cost. Can, can, can I ask, sorry. <laughs> Other question. One of the reasons for inspection is, is that some of your components are in effect consumables. I'm talking about, for example, mooring chains, which may have fatigue damage or, or yeah. um, progressive degradation. Um, the same might apply in the longer term in the context of flexible pipeline rises and so on. Um, 
you have no problem until you have a very serious problem because right. at some stage you have to detect that the quality of your component has vanished. So, so I think this is where your, your life of asset integrity regime takes account of. It was designed for this particular duration. And as you start to step towards the end of it, you either need to say, we increase the intensity of that, which would be counter to what I've been uh, you know, talking about here, mm. or you actually take it out of service and replace it. A bit like an airplane, right. which is designed to land for a number of times and the fatigue cycles on the wings. And uh, you then say, well, it's had its life. And because of the consequence, we're not going to fly it again. There are some aspects or parts of the subsea environment where you would say that is maybe something that you need to do. But you would look intensely before that point to start to see evidence of it. Um, so there's been obviously a lot of great ideas of how like operations people can disrupt themselves and make more use of data and stuff. Um, what would you like to see your colleagues in projects and future developments doing? to disrupt themselves to make your future life easier. Uh, very good. So I, I think uh, uh, it's not so many years ago when projects and designs didn't really take fully account of what was going to be required in operations to keep it within the window. And so we started to make that a requirement of a project to actually look at it from a whole life perspective. So is it inspectable? Do you have the tool for it? And if there isn't a tool that's needed for to keep that in within the uh, design constraint or the design envelope, part of the project should also be to develop that tool. So that's part of the requirement that we've uh, we've developed uh, for a project before it goes through the sort of sanction gate. There's no point in spending all that money designing it, constructing it, installing it if you can't actually inspect for the failure mode, which the designer predicted. So projects have to take account of that, and. Uh, the full reliability cycle will start to work then once you start to get operations and performance data coming back out of operations, back into new design. We work with the designers, but designers also take account of what is it that you can actually do or can't do. If there's a known technology gap, the project should be driving that technology gap from the project stage. So I, 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 would, I think the answer is designers and operators, they have to work really closely together to make sure that we don't design something that's impractical, that can't be maintained, that can't be operated. Yeah, on that note, do you think that in future the op operators will uh, disclose more information to the designer or other parties to get the benefit? Because one of the things that maybe happened in the past that people didn't have access to lots of yeah. uh, useful information that you have. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, so from a proprietary perspective, uh, individual companies would not be transparent about the performance data and we've tried to use databases to get that to become transparent and uh, that's, been a, that's been a real wrestle. Uh, the aviation industry, the nuclear industry, they're required to do that. I think that's probably where you're coming from. The subsea industry, the oil and gas industry has not. But when you're faced with a common uh, requirement to actually survive within the economic environment that we're in now, that becomes an imperative. And if you go back to uh, uh, the, uh, for example, the, the, the digital focus, as we start to make data transparent to people who can work on that, it's quite likely that operators are going to start sharing knowledge of failures across themselves, potentially before suppliers do, unless suppliers start becoming part of the end solution. So I think it's the transparency. You get to the point where you're clear on what data do you need. What do you need to assure against the failure? And then you become very transparent on that with each of the parties that owns it, who has the accountability for designing and making sure that component will work. Do you think it's going to happen by 2020? Well, well, data sharing? well if it doesn't, then what happens is you, uh, you have components that uh, are going to fail, that are going to require a high level of uh, inspection. That, so to answer your question, I think this is the imperative. It's an imperative that people will uh, look at here and say, we have to. So there's a rapid changing, rapidly changing world there, and I think the transparency of data will cause it to happen. Just like a few, uh, BP uh, Angola. So over the years, the oil and gas industry uh, have been a sponsorized um, database such as uh, Orida, yeah. uh, where uh, fellow mode um, are captured. Mm -hmm. uh, in Angola, we created another database to be more regional specific. 
So my question is, um, how much credit would you give to those database uh, in a day-to-day -day, um, um, in safety inspections? Would you? I'm probably not the right person to ask, but if you don't have an open transference of data with a big company with many regions, you can start to develop your own relative understanding. But I think this becomes really powerful when everybody, back to your question, when everybody starts to play into the same. I mean, that was one of the problems of Arida, as I understood it to be, where we were not getting the, the transparency. And there's a lot of proprietary interest preventing that from occurring. So I think uh, the database approach with open, transparent sharing is what's going to drive the paradigm shift. But as far as the specific database, uh, I think you'd have to ask an expert and say, is this working? Excuse me, just to ask you, I don't know much about this business, but it's very funny to me that like you and BP, you've got the operations people, and they don't tell the people who are building it all the problems they've had. Well, I think you, you've got to look at, we do now, I mean, that, that has changed rapidly, but I think the subsea business has, it's grown very rapidly over the last 20 years, and and um, there was proprietary advantage uh, companies that could develop people that could provide components so they didn't share openly what was happening it had to be searched for and um, that's in the interest of BP they want the thing to work properly yeah, absolutely and they should get the people together yeah. get their heads together and get it sorted out absolutely yeah that seems so, so funny to me yeah. and that business like you're saying redundant pipe and yeah. it's still got oil in it yeah, and it leaked out. Well, someone made a lash up, didn't they? BP. So, I, 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 well, was it a BP line? I'm not sure. Oh, I, I don't know. I thought I must have. Been, I wouldn't be any other lines there, then. Well, there's no, multiple operators in that particular. Oh, region. I well, I don't know. You know. But, but the point is, yeah, you're absolutely right. That was a line that was decommissioned, but not fully decommissioned, and it left a legacy risk for later for us to actually have to wrestle with. Was it a live line or wasn't it a live line? And the whole point of this, though, was to say that we had a creative approach that allowed us to get to the bottom line understanding. One of the actions there is to now actually make sure that all disused lines are properly decommissioned. That's been recognised as a real gap. So you're absolutely right. But the other thing is that, I suppose, between Shell and BP and ExxonMobil, do people talk? They do, and, uh, but we haven't done it enough in the past. I mean, we've, we've joined projects and operations together to get the full life cycle of reliability now working better. Um, the industry has been very siloed, companies have been very siloed, and because the subsea business has been relatively, in the last 20 years, new, it hasn't had the maturity that, you know... You know okay, and on the shipping side, okay, a lot of these, you wouldn't want to let the information known to your other people it's like the in, the in the tanker business, when you're running ships, the in tanker, informal tanker safety minute, there's nothing written down. Yeah. You know, but people discuss what they've had problems on the ships. Yeah. But no one writes anything down because right. they don't want to put, you know, that. I can see the point in some ways, like people don't want to give their data, all the problems they've had, to the other party. Yeah. So, and you can't have it documented, put it that way, like, you know? Yeah. But it seems, you know, it's rather funny to me, but. It is difficult, I must admit, because when you've got, if somebody's had problems, we don't want to let them know all about this light, you know? Yeah. And, you know, that's what happens, isn't it? It is, but I think, you know, when this is costing you a lot of money and it has potentially big risk, it's an imperative you've got to do this. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think in the past, you know, uh, blanket inspection has been something that the industry has absorbed, it's been less visible. But now as the ceiling lowers, it's something that you start to have to wrestle with and say it's an imperative that we can actually work within this. Otherwise, we, we, this isn't a viable piece of business. But I think that, that the maturity of the industry, uh, as it grows, causes all of those things to be shared more routinely. If you look at the motor industry, the air industry, all of those things happen, and it's an expectation. And I think it's because of the re relative recency of the subsea business. It's really only in the last 15 years it's accelerated away from diver depths to, to where it is now, 6,000, 7,000, 2,000 feet, meters of water. Perhaps one constraint on the information you're able to share arises from political considerations and public relations considerations. Because 
from the time you've identified that perhaps a pipeline which is transporting huge amounts of product uh, has a, a, a defect and may need attention, uh, then there is ample opportunity for, for the press and other people to come involved and create a really considerable problems. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you know, that's true. Yeah. 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 There are a few questions online. Yeah, um, if I may, we've got viewers watching online and a few questions have come in. Um, so I can ask the first one, which is, do you see a viable position building monitoring systems into the construction of subsea components and thus negate the need for subsequent subsea inspections through ROV or diver intervention? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's, uh, if, if you've got the ability and confidence to say that design failure, if externally your anodes are such that you're not expecting to have external problems for decades, and your internal conditions are such that you know the composition of the fluid that's going through it, and you know your corrosion inhibitor and your chemical injection inhibitors, <coughs> and you can confidently say that they're actually getting distributed to the places where they, they should be, why do you need to do the external inspections as frequently as we do when you only know an external failure mode is either, say, for example, from dropped objects, troll damage, fishing boat activity, which you can monitor for in different ways. We've got, you know, there are now digital ways of actually monitoring for that risk. So if you could actually start to confidently predict and mitigate internally, yeah, absolutely, it should have a big impact on your, on your need for the external activity. If I can ask a different question. Um, how does disrupting ourselves fit into the business model in the current challenging market conditions? Are you looking at establishing new departments for disruptions and R&D, or industry collaborations or third party consulting on a limited time scale? Well, I think the disruption could be in the form of um, applying a different technology, as I, as I explained here, to what was traditionally resolved in a different way. It turned something on its head. I mean, the drone for me was one where we were looking to mount subsea activities, and there a very cheap drone was flown and very quickly gave a piece of the jigsaw that allowed us to reach a conclusion. I mean, that's an example of disruption. So it could be done from the application of technology, or it could be from saying, actually, we don't need all this data. We only need these two or three pieces of data to allow us to confidently say, with all of this experience we've had, that we don't need to do all of it. That disrupts us. That will disrupt the activity levels that we need to ask for. That's, a, that's, that's really, and from there, you would work backwards and say, the organizations that are needed to support that, it'll be very disruptive because you might have some significant changes to your organizations once you start to drive your assurance and your end goal for fitness for service integrity in a different way. Any more? Um, yeah, I've got another one. Um, I think this relates to an earlier. So the, the question about building monitoring systems is really interesting. I'd like to hear the speaker's view on the future of inspection from this perspective. So I think the angle is we need to invest more on monitoring systems rather than actually investing in developing additional external inspection activities. But the monitor system would ask us to inspect it more, right? It well, may do. Yeah, so yeah. basically, if we, that was my question, if you limit the number of data you get, yeah. and you see a leak, so how you can make sure that it's not going to happen to the other susceptible area on your pipeline, because you already had a leak, so the susceptible areas are a lot, you might yeah. get another one, but if you, ha if you limit the number of your data, then you might miss it, is it not? You could do, and so if, if you've basically got a failure mode which, for which you've got low confidence, you, you wouldn't advocate dropping the level of intensity of inspection. That, that would be a dangerous place to go. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely agree with you. So this is actually about driving cost out, but it's also driving risk down. Risk because you may actually have a lower risk utilisation method. But if you're actually going to do that and miss some big data gaps in a place where you've got low confidence, no, you wouldn't do that. And in fact, you may find that by approaching this from an engineering understanding, you actually identify places where you need to do more, but focus it on those specific areas of failure and those specific data capture points. You might miss the others. You might, yeah, and that's where, that's where the engineering judgment needs to be applied.
That's why you need good engineers. Um, I'll try and combine two oh, nice. points of view into one question, but it relates back to the switch from diver ROV to other ways of inspecting. Um, so one viewer is advocating that is it not risky to reduce the requirements of divers and ROV because the human eye is more capable of spotting uh, possible failures than other means. Um, there are many examples of this. But then someone said, do you, another viewer said, do you think that subsidy inspection will completely change from ROV to AUV by 2020? Uh, so I think as we start to look at what data is needed behind the failure modes, I think you can then start to say, well, what can an AUV do? It can do some things, it can't do other things. You look at what's possible globally and then say, does it provide a business benefit? Is a leverage that it may be able to do some things with higher definition uh, photography better than uh, than you can do at the moment, for example, much faster. On the other hand, I, I, in that first part of the question, the dexterity of a diver in the water, there are some things I know that a diver can do, but very rapidly we got to the point of where that question was applied between divers and ROVs about 15 years ago, and very very quickly there was very little that couldn't be done once the design had been assumed that the diver wouldn't be involved couldn't be done by an ROV. And I think that Trinidad example of where there was a limitation there in the water where an AUV actually was able to see something that the ROV couldn't see. I thought that was fascinating. So you're kind of designing human out of the... Yeah, absolutely. It, exactly right. And I think that goes back to your point about what the projects and the designers need to do. If they can start to focus on the end in mind, which is actually having the humans out of this, and but having systems that will get the data behind the, uh, the failure modes, uh, I think this is where the real prize is going to be. So I, that's why I say I think this is going to disrupt things if we start following these pathways. I mean, other industries are doing this, and I think it'll happen in the subsea business, which means it needs to be part of the long-term strategy that the companies that we're all in are uh, developing. There's real, it's, there's real, there's road to travel here. That's all right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any more questions? For Okay, then. Thanks, Dale, for this very informative and enlightening presentation. And on behalf of our institute, I'd like to hand over the certificate to you as a partner of our appreciation. Thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, let's give a big round of applause.